Um, so, uh, so that talk was a, a good setup for this one, I think. Um, so today I'd like to discuss a new technique for performing oximetry. Um, the technique has some advantages over Lambert-Beer law based oximetry, and it uses laser objective speckle. Um, so the technique is, is shown here. Um, a monochromatic, highly coherent laser beam uh, is directed at a sample of red blood cells. The light scatters from the red blood cells with random phase. It interferes in the far field, creating uh, the characteristic speckle pattern shown here. And the, uh, that pattern is recorded by a camera without a lens. And that's why this is referred to as laser objective speckle. And one of the main points I want to communicate today is that the size of these speckles depends directly on the degree to which the incident light is absorbed by oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. So um, we've already heard about some of the disadvantages of Lambert-Beard law based oximetry. And one of, the, uh, one of them is this very, uh, um, uh, this, this uh, effect of contrast reduction. So in a young eye, if you look at the transmission profile of a blood vessel, um, shown at this point here in the retina, you see this profile. But if we then could magically track ahead 30 years to when the person is much older, look at that same um, blood vessel profile, we see it's changed. And the result is incorrect determination of the oxygen saturation of the blood vessel. So um, <clears throat> one of the advantages of, of, of this laser speckle technique is that the measurement of blood oxygen saturation is made in the spatial frequency domain rather than the amplitude domain. And Lambert-Beer law uh, obviously is an amplitude-based technique. So the way we envision performing this measurement is um, by shining, uh, directing the laser into the eye where it is focused on the retina, and then imaging <coughs> the speckle at a very unique spot at the pupil plane of the eye. So all this uh, scattering is due to um, increased particulates, um, primarily in the cornea and the lens, which reduce the contrast. And if we image speckle using a camera at this point, um, we expect the spatial frequency of the resulting speckle to be insensitive to this contrast reduction. Okay, so now I'd like to discuss um, my earlier claim that the size of the speckle depends directly upon the absorption of, of light by uh, oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. So if we look at this image right here, we see a laser beam directed through a slab of red blood cells. Um, some of the light is scattered upwards. If we look at that uh, pattern from above, we see how the light diffuses out transversely to the direction of the laser beam. That's often called the tissue point spread function. Um, we're go going to call it the blood point spread function. And so if the light is absorbed very strongly, um, it, it has a chance to only undergo one or two scattering events, and it doesn't move very far from the native diameter of, of the laser beam. But if it's at 633 nanometers, it has a, it's not absorbed highly, it has a chance to make many scattering events, and you actually see a pattern like this. It is almost two millimeters across. And um, these measurements were made with horse blood with 83% oxygen saturation. And you can see as the wavelength decreases, the, um, this blood point spread function decreases in, in size the way I've discussed in this model. And it turns out that the speckle size is inversely proportional to this blood point spread function. So if you have a very small point spread function as shown here, you expect the speckle to be very large. And that's the basis of this technique. Okay, so the experiment is shown here. Um, it's, it's, it's rather simple. We have two lasers, an argon and helium neon. Uh, they allow us to shine eight wavelengths independently, one at a time onto a slab of blood. Um, we then look at the speckle 
with a camera that does not have a lens, and we look at the blood point spread function with, with a, uh, a camera that does have a lens that can image the pattern here. Both of these cameras have cross polarizers, and all the measurements reported on, on, in this talk are made under conditions of cross polarization. Um, this just shows one of the sample holders is two big pieces of glass with some horse blood and 400 micron spacers to mimic, mimic the correlate. Okay, this shows how the data is analyzed. Uh, this is 594 nanometer speckle. Um, we take the two-dimensional Fourier, fast Fourier transform shown here. We fit this to a, a two-dimensional function, a, a Lorentz function, and um, full with half maximum of this gives an estimate of the spatial frequency of the speckle. Now, if we were going to guess how we would expect the spectral spatial frequency to vary with wavelength, we might first look at just a calculation of the uh, lambert beer law transmission shown here. So here, we're looking at transmission through a 400 micron slab, calculating it for blood oxygen saturations of 100, 80, 60, 40, and 10%. So this is transmission on the vertical axis and wavelength from 450 to 650 on the horizontal axis. And you might notice for 10% oxygen saturation, the transmission is the highest of these at wavelengths less than 500 nanometers. Now if we now look at the same thing for spectral spatial frequency, we see a very similar looking pattern. Once again, for 10% oxygen saturation, we see that this has Again, the highest transmission under 500 nanometers. So what we're now going to do is we're going to look at the values of spectral spatial frequency at 633 nanometers at these five different oxygen saturations and plot them versus the calculated ones to get an idea how strongly does spectral spatial frequency vary with, with um, oxygen saturation. And so when we do that, so we have here's uh, speckle spatial frequency, cycles per millimeter, and here's lambert beer law transmission. It fits a, a straight line very nicely, and this indicates that the speckle depends strongly upon the oxygen saturation. So the next thing that, uh, the, the part two of this talk is we actually want to simulate uh, using Monte Carlo modeling, um, the blood point spread function and the speckle to gain a better understanding of what's going on. So I want to point out that um, here is um, the, the <coughs> points, blood point spread function that we measure, but similar patterns are observed under conditions of cross polar polarization in a wide variety of fields for particles ra ranging from fractions of microns to microns. These include looking at backscattering from water droplets in clouds using LIDAR, uh, looking at yeast cells in suspension of liquid. Um, and here you see uh, these four lobes, and this is the intensity pattern of these lobes as a function of angle, and you see these distinct lobes at 45 degrees. Here um, they're looking at backscattered light from milk. We've also done this and seen the same pattern. And the question is, why do you get this very curious pattern, which undergraduates in our lab told us is actually has a name and is called a quadrifolium, and uh, has, I think, a mathematical formula to describe it. Um, so that was one of the first things that we set out to do. Um, so this, this seems to be um, a, a phenomena that, that's, that's almost independent of particle size, and um, so the first two scientists to actually describe this um, were two Japanese scientists, Asakura and uh, Dojario, and they proposed that the light undergoes two 90 degree scattering events. Um, shown here, the light starts out with polarization uh, in this direction, the vertical direction, and then the light goes and makes two 90 degree scattering events such that um, the light exits toward the detector with now horizontal polarization, and it exits at an angle of 45 degrees to the x and y axis. 
And this would, in fact, produce this four-leaf clover pattern that, that I'm showing. So what we did was we decided, OK, we, were, we are going to now simulate this using Monte Carlo modeling. And as a model um, system, we chose ZMAX to perform this measurement because it fires photons in a, in a random direction according to a particular scattering function. And we chose the mean scattering function to uh, describe scattering from these red bug uh, cells. Now, I should say that it turns out that um, these the scattering DLLs, the dynamic linking libraries that ZMAX provides, do not properly account in bulk for polarization, uh, properly for polarization after scattering. And so we decided to actually write our own DLL. And, and that was, due, uh, Gillian Carlos was the one uh, who actually wrote that DLL with, with uh, help from uh, Paul Zamet in our lab. And that's based around the gold standard for me scattering written by Wiscombe and Fortran in 1979. And um, the only inputs for this are the wavelength of light, the absorption and scattering coefficients for blood, and D, the, the effective spherical diameter of the red blood cells. So lo those were the inputs that we put in. And here we show, um, hard to see, a very thin slab of blood. There's a large window next to it to prevent back reflections, a lens to focus the light in. And we have a detector over here that we're actually imaging the pattern with. This shows a, an a increased scale um, image uh, right here. This is actually the slab of blood. And you can see that each of these rays is scattering wildly all over the place. Um, so here's our result. This is actually the, um, this is the uh, uh, experimental measure of the blood point sp spread function. This is two millimeters. I should point out, I believe this is the first time that this pattern has been observed in blood. And uh, as, as such, I think that it's of fundamental interest to anyone who performs measurements pointing laser beams at blood under conditions of cross-polarization. And here, at the same scale size, is a simulated pattern at 633 nanometers as well. And at least by eye, I'm not saying this is a quantitative comparison, you can see that the patterns look quite similar. They're approximately the same size. Their lobes are at 45 degrees. And the general shape of the lobes is, is um, quite similar. So the next thing we look at is, does this, <coughs> does this pattern actually change size when we vary the wavelength? So it, this, the pattern is 633 nanometers, this blood point spread function. And yes, as we decrease wavelength, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. However, unlike the two scattering events of these Japanese scientists, we found that, in fact, these patterns are made up of many tens of scattering events, in some instances, as many as 100 scattering events. Um, we believe they accomplished the same effect as these two hypothetical scattering events, but that was a distinct uh, difference. Um, and, and I think that's a new result uh, as well. So um, what we're going to do next is actually produce the speckle pattern from the point spread function. The way you do that is, is you randomize the phase of each of these pixels. You take the Fourier transform, and, and that allows you to produce the speckle, which I think we can see the resolution, the, the screen focus has now been adjusted so that you can actually see for this large point spread function, you get very small speckle. And at 543 nanometers for a much smaller point spread function, you see very large speckle. Great. So in conclusion, um, speckle oximetry can be used to measure blood oxygen saturation in vivo, in vitro. I think I very much would like its work in vivo, however. Um, uh, we've also simulated the blood point spread function um, using uh, me scattering function and Monte Carlo modeling. And third, we've demonstrated that this ray tracing program, ZMAX, can be used as a platform to model sc scattering of light from blood in physiological systems, including in the eye. 
And as soon as we publish this paper, we will share this me scattering DLL for free with uh, anyone who reads the paper or asks us for it, uh, so that you can you can uh, model any scattering from from blood or other materials that that obey me scattering uh, that you want. So thanks for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions.